Welcome to this episode of Back to the Story, where friends come together to play Dungeons and Dragons. I'll be your DM, Klaus. Let's get started. When you see God's rest surrounded by armies, then know that his desolation has come near. It is my destiny, not yours. Really, it doesn't fucking matter if I'm ready or not. I have to deal with the end of the world, and I'm not ready for that. The reason why any of us are enough for anything is because we have each other. Everyone can change, not everyone will, but everyone can. And every day has been beautiful since. For these are the days of vengeance, to fulfill all that is written. Yes, I know we all want to compare our god's dick sizes right now. My glory is to protect. My virtue is sacrifice. (laughs) <laughs> My curiosity is satisfied. For your sins, I will allow you to seek the knowledge. Have the courage to do what's right and not what's written. And God's rest will be trampled underfoot by the heretics until the times of the harbingers are fulfilled. You've gotten through this before. We can do it again. You've got this. One more time. Campaign one, dragons. Campaign two, snakes. Dra- yeah, dragons without wings. Uh, oh, okay. Snakes on an astral plane. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. Previously, as the bronze scales make preparations for their final conflict with the Harbingers, they find themselves delving deep under the Noor and search for the bane of rotted dreams in the deceased mine of Norhill. After arriving in the dwarfish city of Domheim, their contact, Cathan Armvisor, led them down to the Gravelaw Mines, a death sentence for the worst criminals of the Undercity. After passing through the gates, the scales followed the journal of Dolgra Armvisor, past the ruins of ancient dwarves, down a honeycomb of glowing moss, and entering into a mushroom forest. After flying above the glowing fungi, the scales decided to rest atop the cap of a larger mushroom exploring the nearby surroundings. We come back to the story here. After setting up camp and exploring the nearby gallstone, the scales set to watches as they rested, Ball waking to a vision of fire and destruction. In the darkness of this cavern, the sounds of scampering creatures can be heard moving in the darkness beyond. The forest grows in all the directions, moss and fungi dimly glowing, but little visual beyond the forest itself. Some insects blink flying in the distance, and the sound of running water can be heard as a damp and still musk hangs in the air. What would you like to do? Okay, so Felix will come out of the orb. Good morning, or whatever it is down here. I don't think it matters anymore. Uh, So, I spent the majority of last night... uh, trying to understand Melly's notes and schematics. I think I have translated well enough to give you a diagram of what you need to cut the sapphire into. I admit I am nervous. We only have the one sapphire, and it is rather complex. Uh, So if you would like assistance, I am happy to help but I also don't know who is leading the next bit, but if we're flying again, then maybe we have the time. Uh, yeah. Do you have any experience with gemstones? No, but I have knowledge about with just about anything. Hmm. All right, well, I will do the best I can. Uh, If you want to help me with it, I wouldn't mind that. Just don't get in my light. Well, I assume we can go into the orb where there is general light. Vesper, do you think you understand where we're going enough to head up the next part of the expedition? I believe so. It it was fairly uh, straightforward on the horizon as of last night. As a note, um, why don't you make a perception check? Oh, boy. Uh... Hmm. Eight. I'm better so you, at survival. 
you look around and you look in the direction where you were sort of using these very dim lights in the distant horizon as a marker direction. These glowing lights seemingly much higher than any of the glowing fungus below. Uh, those lights are no longer there. You still remember the rough direction you were heading, but you no longer have a visual dimly glowing heading. I might need a bit to recalibrate and just make sure I'm just make sure, but I'm confident enough if, if you two want to go back into the orb. All right. Uh, just be careful. I'm sure flying up here is safer than on the ground down there, but that doesn't mean it's safe. As we've seen, there's a lot of things that crawl on ceilings. And we definitely heard something moving around last night. Not really sure what they were, or if they're hostile in any way, but we should be careful. We'll keep an eye out and try to be careful while we head over there. Ball, you coming into the sphere? You can be entertained by me and Felix arguing. I think I would like that. Don't want to play around in your pixie shoes with us. Take that as a no. Okay, so, uh, Felix will go into the orb, presumably, with Ellery and, oh my god, uh, Ball. We have to say it now. Well, I mean, it was Swan's <laughs> invention. Tinkerball? I'm dying of happiness right now. I'm glad I'm glad other people think I'm funny and it's not just me. <laughs> All right. We'll go Funny is a strong word. Oh. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Uh, All right. Uh, Anyways. Yeah, we'll go in and I'll start showing Ellery the schematics. It's going to take us 4 hours. And 20 is the magic number you're looking for to not fuck it up. Uh, what kind of check am I going to have to make as I settle in to work on this? I believe you're proficient in the gem cutting or jewelry tool kit. Mm -hmm. So you could do that as in the, ball, in the sphere, Ball um, watches as Felix goes over the schematic, shows you where the various cuts need to be made. Um, and you see on his diagram, various other more of arcane uh, scribbles, um, but he shows you where the cuts need to be made. And it is rather intricate. Is it dexterity based? Yeah. And in this case, it's very precise cuts you need to make with the schematic and with Felix guiding you. Um, you will get advantage on it. Okay. Uh and with my historian thingy uh, being aggressively helpful, the whole time gives you an extra D4 to add um, to your check. Okay. And let's see. I feel like I have something else that I can use to help me with this. But I gotta... Bend, bend luck? I don't know. Is that a thing you have? I, I do have bend luck. Um... I don't know if I can use that on myself, or it has to be on somebody else. I think you can. I'm pretty sure you can do it on others. It's just, um, I don't know if it's skill checks and saving throws, or what the restriction is there. You also have ethos now. I do, but that's for advantage, which I already have. Oh, yeah. Hey, right. Felix helping me? So it says, when another creature... Yeah, that's what I thought. Well, okay, I didn't think that would be a thing, but... I think uh, you should be able to use it on yourself because I don't think I've ever seen you use it ever. So you're not abusing it. <laughs> I've used it like once or twice. But I always forget because it's like a reaction. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll see how it goes. How about that? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we'll see how close you get it with advantage and with an extra D4 from Felix and with I your plus my, whatever. My thingy to give you plus five if we need it. Okay. Um, let me figure out what I'm 
Okay. I might need a little bit extra here. Let's see how my D4 goes. That is 20 exactly. Okay. So you begin making the incisions and the cuts, according to Felix, um, who hovers over, directing your hand, aggressively pointing to the schematic at various points as you slowly cut and chip away at the gem. Uh, slowly whittling it into the shape that you need. And we'll say you make it about halfway through it. I'm going to check in with the flying crew as you're working on that. Uh, so flying crew, that is Vesper and Amson. You guys are flying in the direction you kind of remembered it to be. Um, you both rolled survival checks, 25 from Vesper, 18 from Amson. And you're fairly sure you're heading in the same direction you were before. Um, that you do not have that heading. Um, both of y'all give me perception checks as you are flying over this dimly glowing forest below. Eleven. Oh. Six. Okay. Um, you guys are... Give me an idea of how you're flying. I mean, are you in the forest? Are you just above the caps? Are you flying very quickly? Are you gliding somewhat stealthily? Uh, I think, unless Vesper says otherwise, Amson would be flying about 15 or 20 feet above the average top height of the mushrooms. And then if there's like a tall one coming up, he'll probably lift up a little bit more just to keep the dis keep his distance away from them. Um, but yeah, basically just doing a straight, reasonably chill kind of fly towards them. I think it's definitely a glide at first while we get our bearings of like, okay, we have to make sure we're going this way. And then a little bit speedier once we're confident about the direction. Yeah, just a good cruise. Uh, and I will also remind you, you guys have Pino, and he is an object. If you want to light him up and send him places, he's been told to follow your orders. Yeah, I would love to light both him and my holy symbol before we start. And uh, Pino has some special perception stuff, doesn't he? Uh, just dark vision, I think. Let me look at him. I think it's just dark vision to 60 feet. I don't think he has blind sight. I also but have dark he... vision to 60 feet, but 60 That's feet is not very far. The... Yeah, he just has a it. decent perception. Like, And I can't be surprised. Give me a roll for the uh, Pino as well. All right. Uh, dirty 20. Okay. Um, so you guys are cruising along, staying a little bit above the mushroom caps, uh, flying kind of just, the light is pretty dim from the mushroom, so you're kind of out of that light source, but you can clearly see it. Um, as you're cruising along, the holy symbol lighting your way like a brightly glowing beacon in the dark. Um, Pino is glowing as well, flying ahead. And after about an hour and a half, two hours in, um, Pino's, I don't, George, what does Pino do? How does he communicate? Can he talk? Does he just flash? Does he just go meep, meep, meep? What does he do? I kind of, I actually do like a meep, meep, meep. I imagine his little like dot face does emojis too. So he'll like fly up and like, get really i don't know if he sees a creature he'll like do like fangs or something uh, so Pino does fangs a fangs face and starts pointing upward i will look up uh you see 60 feet into the darkness and that's all yeah i'll slow down like a lot <laughs> or do we want to get there faster um i'll just is he pointing, like, straight ahead and up kind of thing? Up, but you can see he's looking in different directions. Oh, lovely. Okay. Um, I don't want to be in the air if we're going to go through these. Either that or I want to try to avoid them. I'm going to just tuck my holy symbol under my shirt. I can't do anything about Pino glowing, but... Uh, he'll just crawl under your cloak and hide. I'll give him a pat. 
spider tentacles that he has. Uh, should I try to get around them or, like, get some distance or find a landing place? I think no matter what, we have to tell everybody that there's some likely combat happening soon. Yeah. Um, I'll reach back and as I give Pino a little pat, I'll think to Felix and just say, so there's something out here with us. Uh, we haven't seen it yet, but Pino says there's danger above us. Just stay on alert in case we call you. Do you want Ball to come out and support? I will ask Hamson. I wouldn't feel too bad with Ball out here. That would actually be rather nice. That would be lovely, Felix. Thank you. Ball, there's... Uh, Pino apparently noticed something. They're a little worried. Combat's going to start. Since you can fly, you want to go join them? I'm busy. <laughs> no, I... Um, Ball hears that kind of... You see, like, Albemer is kind of leaning against the wall, immediately picks it up, and just starts heading towards the exit. And as he does, kind of nods at you guys. Um, and then... Are you, you guys... Are you guys... Since you're the flying crew, are you guys currently, like, flying? Am I going to fall out of the sphere and immediately have to click my feet? Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. Okay. You automatically get that flying speed, technically. You're just... It, you're fine. Right, okay. It's just more for flavor. Okay, so, um, yeah... Ball kind of does the whole thinking to get out of his fear, and as soon as he does, just for like that brief fraction of a second, he starts to kind of drop, and then he's like, oh shit, and quickly taps his feet, and just starts to hover, and looks up at the two of you and says, um, I heard you needed some help. Yeah, there's supposed to be some creatures in that direction. We can't see them, though. We're just trying to figure out how we're going to approach this, whether we want to find some place to land or just try to avoid them. As you guys are talking, uh, there's a as a arrow flies through the air and into the mushroom cap a little ways below you. A second later, uh, several more arrows um, are fired and arranged in a circle into in, embedded into the mushroom cap below your feet, surrounding you. Where there, where did the arrows came from? Up um, and from all around you. Oh shit. Oh, this is probably whatever killed those goblins. Okay. All right, I'm going to land. <laughs> I'm going to find the largest, most stable-looking mushroom that is as close as possible and land on it. Closest one is the one right below you where the arrows landed. All right, sure. Let's go for it. <laughs> fine. This is fine. You land. Pull Pino out as we land and just... Yeah, we've got company. Not a fight yet, but... They don't seem super friendly. I will pass that on to Ellery as we're like hovering over this tiny gemstone. Just let me get this last little bit here. Uh, okay. Uh, why don't you go out? I'll wait in here and if I need to pop out and surprise them. Um, okay. And I will head out. Oh, finally fucking alone. So popping out, um, you join the rest on the mushroom cap, surrounded by a few arrows, not made out of wood, but with shafts of thin bones, maybe ulnas or... Um, at this point, the, you can all hear sort of a, <laughs> a flapping of wings. You can hear the landing of something on mushroom gaps surrounding you. Uh, still far enough away to be in the darkness. Um, How far away does... Is it obviously further away than 60 feet? Uh, Yeah, you're, you'd guess maybe 100 or so. Give or take in, in kind of a rough circle around you. Uh, roughly how many arrows do I see embedded in the mushroom? Eight. I'm going to pat Amson's shoulder and cast tongues on him. Ooh. Just in case these aren't dwarves. I don't know if we should just sit here. What should we do? Are we trying to make friends? I would prefer that. If they've lived down here, they probably know where we're going. I guess Amson will say, All right, we know you're here. Show yourselves. A couple moments go by. Silence. 
until from out of the shadows you hear a voice returning. Lishafon Tashyakal. It takes you a second for your ears to adjust, um, but it is familiar. It's elvish, or a dialect of it. It's a little different from what you're used to. Certainly not the academic elvish you're used to. Some of the words are different. The cadence, the pronunciation is different. But it is elvish, and those of you who can speak it do understand this individual. It is a strange place for you to be with such bright lights. What is it that you are doing here? Uh, I, gu- I guess I'll quickly translate. Uh, he noticed the lights. Uh, it's strange. Um, we are here on a quest. We are looking for something deep within the bowels of the earth, so to speak. Well, more accurately, up the brain. As we all are, I'm sure. And yet you find yourself here. In our lands. I suppose you wish to pass through. I suppose you are not from here. Down here. No. Do you wish a toll or something like that? What is it that you have the offer? Uh, since I guess I have tons, I'll just speak in common because then he can, everybody can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, he wants to know what we have to offer, or she, or them, I, I don't know. They want to know what we have to offer them. Well, depends on if gems or coin or other goods. I don't, I don't know. Wine. Oh, wine. Could you ask them what one might offer? Deep down here? Uh, sure. Uh, what would be an appropriate offer for a place such as this? We are obviously strangers and do not know your customs. It is customary to give gifts of food and drink. Though the ground is always pleased with arcane artifacts as well. And it appears you to be well equipped. Well, Ellery, I believe we have some rather expensive wine on our person, don't we not? We do have some very nice wine. And some scotch. When did we get scotch? At the same time as the wine. Oh. We actually have more of that left. All right, well, why not? I don't have any food, though. Other than our rations. Hmm. What some of that fire moss? Do you think that would be interesting at all? If you have enough to spare. I've got plenty. Oh, okay. Uh, we have some expensive uh, alcoholic drinks. And we have some strange... Where did you get that fire moss from? Uh, from the... I don't remember the giant word, but the volcano where we met for Sandrock. Oh, and we have some volcanic fire moss. I'm not sure if it's edible, but it's certainly interesting. Show these things to me. I they would they would like to see them. They hear coming from the direction of the voice. Um, You see, flying out of the shadows. uh, For those of you who have some dark vision, um, or illuminated by the glowing holy symbol or pino that's now exposed, you see a. A person riding upon a large um, dog-faced bat-like creature with an elongated neck and sort of hops out of the shadows, gliding on the wings to land upon the edge of the mushroom cap you stand upon. The rider is female, dark purple gray skin, tall and broad-shouldered. She has white hair that's braided and several braids going back. These overly sized, large black eyes. You see, her nose is broken. Um, looks like she's been in conflicts before. Wears dark hides, silvered gauntlets, and holds a short recurve bow in her hand and a spear on her back. As the creature kind of lands, turns sideways, she peers over at whoever is holding what out towards her. Um, I imagine we probably have the alcohol inside the sphere. Uh, Uh, so I will say to her, it'll take me a minute to retrieve the scotch, but I'll be right back. And I'm going to pop back into the sphere. 
to and go I'll, grab a bottle. While that takes a full minute, I will uh, hold up two of the vials of fire moss that glow faintly. She gestures, gestures for you to come closer and bring them to her. I and do so. While this is happening, um, Fall kind of in the background wants to cast uh, Divine Sense. Um, and I always forget, it tells me if they're a celestial fiend or undead within 60 feet. Um, none of those. Am I still out there when he does that? Probably. So why don't you tell me what, or tell Ball what he senses? So I'm not entirely sure what this means, but Ball will have it revealed to him that I am an otherworldly entity. How do you think that would show up on, like, Ball's divine sense radar? Like, would it be, would it feel like, you know, like, it, it, I guess Ball can only sense celestial fiends or undead. Is it just like you are, it feels like you're some combination of all three or like a fourth kind of be kind of happens? This might be like a fourth kind of signal. And you've never noticed this from Ellery before. I like to think maybe I'm like, just as I'm trying to make sense of it, that's when you kind of teleport back into the sphere. And then that kind of sensation fades. So Ball kind of looks puzzled and just kind of continues to, you just, he's just kind of staring where Ellery was um, while uh, Vesper passes over or walks up or does your thing. And I hate wasting a spell slot, but I am going to cast tongues on myself before I walk up to her. Okay. She takes one of the vials and holds it in her hand, feeling the, the warmth, looking it over, holding it up to her eyes, inspecting it. I will um, describe whatever properties I've learned about it since we've picked it up. She sort of nods, not quite looking at you. Um, but as you finish, she looks, she does look back up at you, gives you a strange furrowed brow look as she looks you over. You're not quite uh, Umbra Mary, but uh, similar, perhaps. I am an elemental, actually. A mix of fire and air heritage it lends me your lovely coloration. She raises an eyebrow at that. <laughs> this is not often that we have visitors from the surface. The crown will be uh, interested to see you. Now where is this uh, drink you speak of? Um, when I pop into the sphere, I glance at Felix, uh, some kind of welcoming committee, they want gifts, grab a bottle of the scotch, and pop back out. Uh, I'm going to take that opportunity to go out with her, since now it seems like everything's kind of been revealed. And I have questions. Okay. So Ellery returns with Felix. Uh, the female uh, looks surprised to have a sudden extra figure there. Um, I will approach with the bottle and kind of nod in Felix's direction. He's the last of us. I'm curious where you're hiding, all of you. And she reaches out for the bottle. I will pass it to her. Is this one closed? Is this one been yes. opened? Yes. This one has not been opened. She begins to open it. This is some she... nice stuff. It's a... Uh... There's apparently a dragon involved in making it. I'm not exactly sure of the process. She gives it a... Once she opens it, she gives it a sniff. A swig. Smacks her lips. You don't... Delighted by it. And the crown will be pleased by this. I hope you'll have another bottle. We will guide you there. You can present your gift to her, and she will judge you. Hi. Yeah, uh, we're in a bit of a rush, so 
why don't you present the bottle and we'll be on our way. Unfortunately, that is not how it works down here. Can I cast suggestion on her? She certainly can. All right. I'm going to suggest that you just take the bottle and go and leave us be. And I would like to use a portent so that she rolls a natural five. What does this look like when you cast this spell? I think for the most part, Amson said, like, he says it, but for some reason, she, like, if she's just turning around away or something, she turns back and Amson's looking very pointedly at her. And then maybe it, assuming, like, it doesn't work or whatever, uh, she, like, pauses for a moment as the spell tries to take effect. As she meets your gaze after you speak to her, um, her eyes narrow for a moment before she reaches her hand out um, to to take the bottle once more. I suppose it uh, is only right that I uh, make sure that this is safe for the ground. We will uh, we will let you uh, pass freely. I will present this. Yeah. You are too kind. You quick fortune in your riding. As do I wish Where? it to you as well. Of course. Ride swiftly. She takes the bottle and puts it into a uh, harnessed satchel on, on the saddle-like equipment on this bat-like creature um, before she begins to prepare to leap off the mushroom. Okay, everyone back in the sphere. <laughs> leaps into the air again. You hear similar noises from the shadows beyond your dark vision surrounding you as other creatures seem to be taking flight once more. All right, let's not linger here too long. And I'm going to start getting back into the sphere. You're both going to have to teach me Elvish at some point. Mine isn't very good, so... Well, I'll have Felix teach me then. Good luck with that. Okay, let's go, let's go, let's go. Would you like me to stay outside for a little while? If you could please, Paul, that would be amazing, thank you. Great. Ellery, you still have work to do. <sighs> yes, 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 I do. So as you guys continue, um, get some getting back into the sphere, um, Ellery and Felix, over the next two hours, you complete the gem investing it appraising it making sure and it does seem to be fitting the schematic um, exactly okay well i hope this works do you need me to set it into that ring now i think that's part of the process cutting and setting it okay. in from here from here, I, it's on me. I have to inscribe it. But thank you. You really did a fair job. I just kind of smirk when he says that. Uh, coming from Felix, that is high praise indeed, so I will take it. Well, I'll leave you alone for that. And I guess I'm going to play some solitaire. Ball should come back in eventually. The... Boots don't last all day, so I'm sure you'll have someone to play with. I'll... I won't comment on his phrasing, and I'll just uh, get out my playing cards and set up a game of solitaire. And, yeah, sometime around that two-hour mark, um, Ball will come in. Or let we'll let um, Vesper and Anson know. Um, well... Doesn't look like we're being followed by anyone, so I'll go back inside for a little while. Great. Thank you, Ball. Thank you, Ball. And you're going quickly or quietly as you're continuing to fly? I think speed over self was our mantra from the get-go, right? Yes. Um, and suggestion lasts for up to eight hours as long as I concentrate on it, so I'll just keep going with that as well. Okay. Okay. Um, so as you're flying for another two hours or so, uh, you begin to see, and it's a little more left than you thought it was going to be, but you begin to see 
some dim glow of these strange moss-like vines that goes higher by a good fifty feet, higher than the crown tops. You can see there it outlines the silhouette of some massive structure that rises up um, into the shadows to wherever the ceiling of this cavern is. This appears to be where the tower is, and it's about it's maybe 250 feet away at this point. You'll give me some perception checks. Okie dokes. Got it. I'm bad at these. <laughs> Seven. <laughs> okay, that's not as bad. Uh, Fifteen. Okay. Does Pino get to try again? Yeah, he can. Uh, Twenty-one. <laughs> okay. Um. Uh, so all three of you notice that the structure, based on the silhouette, is maybe 80 feet wide, or in diameter maybe, and it's hard to tell how high it is because it goes outside of your vision, um, but it seems to be pretty tall. Large structure. Uh, Amson, you hear movement up ahead, and not just movement, but voices, many of them, mostly on the ground near the structure. Pino notices this as well as the movements um, above and around hearing the flaps of wings and tries to signal through emoji faces to Amson and Vesper. Why don't we find a place to land and hide and I'll consult the map. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Um, I will look for a Navigate. place to hide. Easy enough to, to drop down and hide behind a, a mushroom at this point. If you're just finding a, a place to stop. Yeah. And I just want to get the map out and the notes and see kind of from where we are versus where the tower is, how to go like around and get where we need to go. So based off the map looking at it, the next step was to use one of the faces that's carved into the stone, into this tower, to go in the direction that face is pointing. And she didn't think to write down what direction that was in her notes. There is a like drawing. There is a drawing on in the notes of the face, but it's not super clear which direction exactly you're coming from and which direction you need to go. You could guess and gamble it, and you think you might have a 50 oh, 50 God. shot of hitting mm -hmm. the right place. No. <laughs> um, I could try to fly on the broom and go invisible and try to find the face uh, on your own i mean can i make the rest? i can make uh i can make everyone invisible but that's a rather powerful spell um i can make both of us invisible but again that's a more powerful spell <sighs> don't like the idea of letting you go by yourself but that's probably the best bet yeah, show me what that face looks like. I'll get a good get a good idea of what it looks like, and I'll try to find it quickly. I'll drum the notes and everything. There's really no, like, dwarvish word for, I don't know, west. Is there? <laughs> There's a vague direction um, that points from the tower on this, and it's not a map. It's not like a cartographer's map. This is like doodles in the side of a journal. So it gives you a rough idea, but um, it is not precise by any means. So there is an arrow, um, and you could attempt to use that alone, but without knowing where the arrow is coming from, where the face is um, carved on the outside of this tower, it might not be super clear that you're going in the right direction. You could try it, but it'd be a risk. All right. Amson will look at face. Up. Oh, go, go ahead. The face itself, and... and she wasn't a phenomenal artist, but a decent doodler. The face itself is a beardless uh, female giant face, heavy brow with uh, tattoos on her shaved temples. Empson will take a look at it. Oh yeah, that's not very helpful. Um, okay, yeah, I'll try to find that face. I'll, I'll be quick, I promise. And uh, Empson gives Vesper a quick kiss before he gets on the staff. Okay. I will reluctantly let him get back on the staff and go. Right. I'll cast invisibility on myself and just 
check below me to make sure that the staff is also invisible. I was just looking that up because I'm not sure. <laughs> it says... Wearing or carrying. Yeah, so the staff is invisible. Okay. Are you... uh I'm trying to think how to word this. Do you have oh do you have message or sending or anything like that? Uh, I have message. Okay. Do so not message... cast that unless you don't want to be invisible. Right. So I'm yeah. saying if something goes wrong, then you cast it to me. But I'm gonna give uh you the sphere and I'm gonna hang on to Pino. So you can message me, I'll tell Felix, everyone will pop out where you are. Perfect. Alright. I'll be quick. Uh and then slowly creeping invisibly, levitating above the ground, I'm going to go to the tower and hopefully find this face. Okay, give me a stealth check first, followed by a either perception or investigation. Okay, so stealth at advantage because I'm invisible. And levitating. Uh, I'm going to use luck. Uh, it was an okay roll, but I want better. That is much better. Uh, so 28 stealth. And then the either investigation or perception will be a disadvantage since you don't have a light source. Unless you are using one. Uh, that's eh. That's not great, but I have a good investigation. Um, 13 investigation. Okay. And uh, give me an idea, are you flying close to the ground? Are you hovering right above the caps? Are you kind of flying in? Uh, I think I'll get onto the staff, and then I'll levitate off the ground about three or four feet, just so that I'm safely off the ground. Um, and then I'll fly towards the um, the tower, and then... Assuming nothing is in the way. Uh, actually, no. I'm going to fly up about eight or nine feet and then fly to the tower. And then from there, I'll search the tower kind of up and down, combing around it until I find okay. the face. Um, so flying above the ground, um, stealthily weaving between the trunks of these mushroom fungi, the dim glow of the moss and the vines and some of the undercaps of the mushroom, um, you begin to hear those voices ahead of you, to the left, behind, um, more and more concentrated as you get closer and closer to the tower. You begin to see people, like the one you just saw, these dark gray-purple, blue-skinned, um, elvish individuals with big dark eyes and white hair you see either most of them seem to either be mounted on those strange bat creatures or be next to one uh, mostly wearing hides and leathers and rather simple clothes all of them have bows you see this small horde as you stealthily fly above them and around them giving them a berth as you come towards the pillar this tower is maybe 80 feet in diameter. You see the large entrance to it is massive. It's maybe 30 feet tall, maybe 20 feet wide. The steps are built for giants. You see all around the outside of the stone carvings of faces, giant faces. Um, you see tents. Amongst these people, seemingly a nomadic people that move, mounted on these bats. Um, most of them are all wearing similar darker hides, sometimes silver or chitin or dark metal, shoulder pauldrons or gauntlets. There is one that seems to be wearing white. But um, inspecting the pillar, it takes you a little while to stealthily, quietly move around the pillar as. These mounted people are on the ground, but also on top of the mushrooms. Some of them seem to be in the tower. Some are hanging off the side of it, flying around. As you slowly investigate, um, it takes you 30, 40, about 50 minutes as you're kind of circling, spiraling up, looking at each face until you eventually find one. Um, 
face that appears to be the correct one. You kind of turn, um, getting your bearings once more, remembering where Vesper was left. Um, and you kind of gauge the direction you need to head. Okay. So I'll make a note of that. You know, I'll do that thing where I'm looking directly at the face, and then I'll turn exactly 180 degrees as the notes say. And then I'll fly in that direction a little bit until I see something that I can identify as like a landmark, you know, like a rock formation that looks a certain way or, you know, something like that. And then I'll make a note of that and then quietly turn and fly back over to Vesper. I think Vesper's been... Well, she's at least tried it once of having the dragon bone dice that she has and seeing if Pina will chase them if she rolls them. <laughs> he absolutely will. I think he oh, has my actually been alive, quote unquote, for like three days. So like he doesn't have any idea what is anything. <laughs> oh, I love him so much. <laughs> Yeah, so I've been playing, I think, outside of the nerves, I've lost track because I'm just, like, playing with Fino and having him chase these dice. <laughs> he thinks that's what you want, and that he exists only to serve you. <laughs> so, Amson, uh, flying forth, you eventually find another one of those rocks. Um, like that strangely somewhat pyramidal gallstone. Similar. Um, though this one has a different shape, different symbols on it. Um, but you can use that as a landmarker before heading back to Vesper. Give me another stealth check on your way back. Okay, I had advantage because I'm invisible still. That was almost a natural 20. Um, uh, yeah, I gotta use luck. That was absolute garbage rolls. Okay, that's a lot better. That's another 28. I rolled two twos. <laughs> and, and then a 16. <laughs> okay, so as you're weaving between the mushroom trunks, um, you hear a sudden loose, the twang of a, a bow being loosed and arrows uh, flying in your direction. Um, a stroke of dumb luck um, as you just drop as you hear the arrows fly over your shoulders into the trunk. Uh, you look back and you hear and see the high-fiving of um, these Umbra Mary uh, as they are clearly using the trunk. You were just passing by as target practice. They don't seem to notice you as you quietly drift away. A few minutes more before arriving back at Ves to find Vesper playing dice fetch with Pina. Uh, I think to warn Vesper that he's here, he's just going to take his knuckle and, like, knock on the rock next to her or something like that. Hello. Um, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything's fine. Thank you, God. I think I found Seven. it. Find him and hug him. I'm right here. I'm right. There we go. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm fine. Everything's good. Uh, uh, I think I found it. There's a gallstone in the direction of the face that I should be able to remember. Um there how many how many elves did I see? It's hard to tell with your dark vision, but you would guess several hundred. Three hundred, five hundred. Alright. You didn't see that many. You wouldn't count that many, but judging on how many voices and how spread out they seem to be at their camp, you would guess something around there. So the camp is absolutely huge. Uh, there's probably like 300 people there. Um, we really do not want to be detected by them. So, um, mind if I make you invisible as well? I would love nothing more than to be invisible right now. Yeah. Okay. And I'll pick up Pino so he can, I'm carrying him. Okay, good. Um, all right. Uh, I'm going to, cast another third level spell <laughs> uh, so that we both are invisible uh, and then uh, get back on the staff and fly towards the gallstone trying to avoid that target practice tree this time <laughs> sure uh, both of y'all give me stealth checks 
add advantage. Yes. I don't trust any of my dice tonight, though. Oh. Oh, God. Thank God there's advantage. Oh, boy. Not as good. Oh, okay. But still okay. Okay, really? Okay, really? That's Tw fun. That's a... 24. <clears throat> uh, five. What? I rolled a one, and then I rolled a two. You're the worst rogue. <laughs> I'm like you. You've got you you've got like say. three levels in rogue. It's fine. I don't have proficiency in stealth. You're a rogue, and you I'm don't. I'm a have... doctor. Okay, fine. <laughs> okay. Um. So you stealthily fly towards the stone. A uh, different shape, but using it to orient yourself again. Um. You begin flying in the direction the face was facing. And as you guys are flying the rest of you inside the sphere, is there anything you guys are doing? Um, I think as soon as Ball came into the sphere, I'm like, oh, thank the gods. Come over here. I'm so sick of solitaire. Because it's been like two hours of solitaire. And then we'll play the equivalent of that. What was that Go Fish game that Ball and Felix kept trying to play? <laughs> that Ball could never beat Felix until his brain was zapped. So Ball will suggest that we play that game. Anything but solitaire. Uh, Ball starts to kind of to shuffle and get ready to deal with that. Uh, and Felix will start the next step of ring preparations. So I don't think I'm going to have time to finish it before we have to fight a dwarven or dwarven drow city. Okay. Um, so uh, Felix, you begin setting, you know, begin um, your inscriptions as Hampson and Vesper, you guys are flying along. Um, I hope 20 minutes go by. And Vesper, you feel a tickle under your nose. You've noticed this before around some of these fungi with spores and you feel like you're going to sneeze. Clap my hand up and... So it's not just sticking your finger under your nose, it's pushing your upper lip against your gums, and that's supposed to help stop the need to sneeze. Okay. Uh, you try as best you can to stifle the sneeze, and it is pretty quiet. Um, but the jostling of Anson and the staff turns you off course for a moment. Um, you guys, Vesper, there's a quick and sharp kind of silenced cry that sneaks out as you grasp the staff again to keep from falling off, riding yourself. Five minutes go by. And then there is a arrow that slams into your back. You take seven points of piercing damage. Great. Ear. And very swiftly from behind, a the bat-like creature uh, uh, with a rider flies by. Quickly passes by, not seemingly to immediately notice. Just reach back and snap that off. You can hear this rider is flying, kind of circling the area. He'll give me another stealth check. Both of you. I love invisibility. With advantage or just standard? Uh, you'll still have invisibility, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So with it, man. Natural 20. Oh, thank God. Another 28. What is these 16s? <laughs> okay. Uh, so you continue flying quietly. Vesper, you kind of stifle the the pain, keeping from moaning or letting any sound come out, quietly snapping the bone arrow um, out and removing it. Um, Eventually, you hear the kind of circling of this scout rider uh, fade away behind you. About an hour or so more, and you begin to hear the flowing of water louder and louder as you begin to reach, well, what was supposed to be a riverbed. But you hear water running through it. You can see the wall of the cavern and eventually find your way down to looks like an opening, large. Seems to be made by or made for giants. 
um, there's a dock that kind of reaches out to a large tunnel. It seems to be patterned, um, not in, not entirely natural, um, almost perfectly um, circular. This tunnel um, with rushing water. Uh, is it other than the water? Is it pretty quiet at this point? It is. Okay. Uh, Amson will probably lean back at this point and say, very, very quietly, um, I think it's pretty safe here, maybe? I hope so. Pino, do you see anything? Pino doesn't seem to have any emojis besides the blank stare emoji. All right, um, I would feel wonderful if everybody else was here right now. So I'm going to find a place to land, and I'll find a place to land. Okay. You can land upon the, the stone dock. It kind of has a ledge creeping out over the river in this tunnel. There seems to be a pattern to the tunnel itself. You have this, these intermittent ridges, um, and as I said, it is nearly perfectly circular. About the bottom half seems to be filled with water. The diameter is maybe 30-ish feet, sometimes a little greater, 35. Everyone out, we're in the clear. I'll pass that along. Are you staying in here to work, Felix? No, I think I need a break. And he will reach into his bag and grab a bottle of wine and make his way towards the exit. How much wine did you bring with you? That is for me to know. All right. And we will pop outside. Okay. All who exit the sphere find themselves on a stone dock, giant, carved in um, old-fashioned. The columns that kind of hold up the entrance into this river tunnel um, have totems of beardless, uh, strong-browed faces, giants. There's an old, what looks like a canoe, though it's the size of a small boat. Um, Old and maybe broken off to the side, made of not wood, but some sort of fibrous material. The water is rushing fairly quickly downward before turning around a curve to the right. The tunnel itself, as I said, is maybe 30, 35 in diameter and nearly perfectly circular. Oh, who feels up for a swim? Sorry that took so long. That was, that was a lot. <laughs> I take it you didn't uh, have too much trouble, though? Uh, we're, we're fine. You both seem like you're in one piece. We're fine. You know, it might have been easier if we had just gone to meet this, uh, well, whoever. Probably would have been faster, actually, but, eh. Somehow I doubt it, but that's, I guess I'm just being optimistic. Anyways, what do we have in front of us here? Oh, water. Lovely. I'm going to take the next ten minutes and cast water breathing on everybody as a ritual. Don't even want to take the risk. Do we want to tie ourselves to each other so that we don't get lost in the currents, if there are any? I am a very poor swimmer, so I would love that. It's probably a good idea. Uh, it's probably a good idea to look for something we can use to not have to swim, because you've seen the denizens of this place. That's a good point. I don't suppose we can get that boat over there in working order. Don't see why we couldn't. Uh, if, uh, if we need a boat, I have a patch that creates a boat. I kind of look at Amson and tilt my head. How many fucking patches do you have? Uh, not a lot. I have five left. A boat, a ladder, a dagger, a lantern, and 50 feet of rope. That is all I have left. <laughs> I mean, 
mean, a boat, boat would be handy. All right. And so we'll go up to the end of the dock. Well, maybe we should look and see if there's something we can do with the boat that's already here first. Never mind. And then if, and then if there's not, then we can use the patch. We look at the boat. Okay. Uh, going over to this large canoe that's maybe the size of a, a small boat. Um, it's maybe 30 feet long, um, maybe 15 feet wide. Um, maybe it's probably actually 35 feet long. Um, but otherwise, it looks to be built like a canoe, though out of this fibrous, fungi fibrous material. There's a few holes in it. Um, it looks like the material is old and semi-rotted. Huh. I don't know. Not sure this is going to be getting anyone anywhere. I could theoretically make us a raft, but it would have to be tomorrow, and I don't know that we want to camp already. How large would the raft be? Sorry, looking at the spell. Uh, it has to be contained within a 10-foot cube, so still not big enough to hold ball, and probably not that much better than your boat. Uh, yeah, no, my boat is not much better. Couldn't Ball carry one of us across since he's still got the flying shoes? He's a strong boy, and we're all small squishies. Uh, I don't know how long this is, tunnel is going to go. And Ball's shoes will only work for about two more hours today. I can turn into a giant octopus for an hour. Just putting that out there. Just putting that out there. Thank you, Ellery. Or I could turn one of you into one. No. <laughs> uh, absolutely not. Um, either way, do we want to just sit here for a moment, maybe grab some food, take a small break while we try to fin figure this out? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Yeah, we've been on the road for four hours or so, four or five hours. Something like that. Um, Klaus, question. What direction is north? Uh, um, up and to the right. Up and to the right. Okay, I'm just going to kind of keep that. Wait, I lied. Down and to the right. Down and to the right. Uh, I will go ahead and cast Create Food and Water to get us enough supplies for the full day. It is bland but nourishing. Right. I make a face when I try it. Rice and beans. <laughs> if anyone has pressed a digitation, you may flavor as you wish. Press the digitation. Press the digitation. <laughs> I'm gonna heal, try and heal myself up. Took an arrow to the back, and I don't like that. Yeah, there we go. I honestly don't feel like spending another however many hours in the sphere while you two are out here flying. I am not getting back on that stick for the rest of the day. Well, can all. If it's just Ball, can the stick take him? I don't, I don't think so. Um, one of the boats might be able to hold Ball. Um, but nobody else. Any idea how deep this water is? Uh, I'll pull off of my rope and start feeding it in. Let's see. Uh, uh, you're gonna have want to wait that first so it'll actually drop down to the bottom wait, and not wait. just float. Wait. Uh, if you get the boat, I, Pino's still charged with spider climb. Ball, if you don't mind, you can just walk on the wall. And that way Amson and Vesper can take a rest and trade out and Ellery and I can man the boat. You can do that. Y'all, that is wild, but I love it. <laughs> Ball marching upside down. Okay. Ball's upside down, but he's so tall that his head is still underwater. <laughs> like your Ball head is bumping into their heads. Oh, <laughs> Ball drowns <laughs> while walking on the wall. 
Oh boy. So are y'all taking a short rest before you do this or I yeah, just get I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so as y'all take a short rest preparing um, to engage this boat uh ball walking ceiling plan, uh we'll go ahead and take a break here in real life. We'll come back in a few minutes. Next time, on back to the story. And then when I open them, I think Ellery sees like a little third eye glow in pink on my forehead that sort of like pulls away and then turns invisible. And I will cast Arcane Eye. There's another strange psychic aura that makes you feel uneasy. Your mind almost starts to, starts to throb like a, the beginnings of a migraine. Something, a presence here. This episode is continued in part two, which uploads Friday and will be available wherever you're listening now. For behind the scenes and more, check out our Tumblr, back to the story at tumblr.com, and follow us on Twitter for updates at back to underscore the story. And if you're feeling especially generous, feel free to buy us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash back to the story. We'll see you next time in Norrithville.